Good morning, good evening, hello once again to everyone. Thank you very much for joining and I think we can start. Great. Um, I am uh, Jonathan Murphy and colleagues, I have the honor to open the Agora Parliamentary Development Community of Practice Workshop titled Mapping and Connecting Parliamentary Research Services Around the World on behalf of the organizers of this exciting event. I'm head of program at InterParis, which is the European Union's global parliamentary development project implemented by International IDEA. Our program aims to strengthen the capacity of partner parliaments in emerging democracies, leveraging the skills and capacities within European Union national parliaments. And our mandate also includes enhancing global parliamentary development and interparliamentary cooperation. For today, through the Agora Parliamentary Development Community of Practice, we have partnered with the UK's Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology and the European Centre for Parliamentary Research and Documentation, ECPRD, to organize this workshop about the role of parliamentary research work in building stronger democratic parliaments around the world. The Agora Parliamentary Development Community of Practice was launched in 2021 by a group of implementers, uh, including us into Paris, uh, NDI, Westminster Foundation for Democracy, the German Bundestag, uh, NIMD, UNDP, Parlamericas, and Directorio Legislativo. It has been joined subsequently by many other important parliamentary development actors. Through 2021 and 2022, partners of the community of practice organized four online thematic public sessions, welcoming more than 500 participants to the events. Today is our first public event in 2023, and we are extremely excited to have received more than 250 registrations from 30 different countries. And this is the largest number of registrations we have had to date for any of our COP events. We know that for some of you, it is very early in the morning, and for others, it's very late in the evening, and maybe for others, it's between the evening and the morning. We truly appreciate that you are here with us today. For those who couldn't join, we will provide follow-up materials, um, but networking and friendly space for discussion will of course only be available for those who are with us today online. In the coming three hours, we will hear from parliamentary academic fellows with the Parliament, UK's Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, Dr. Vicky Ward and Dr. Mark Monaghan, on the work they have done to map the services helping parliaments across the world to access and harness research evidence. Um, Dr. Ida Kellerman, coordinator of the Parliamentary Libraries Research and Archives section at ECPRD and head of the Parliamentary Research Service at the Hungarian National Assembly, will present the European landscape of parliamentary research services. We'll learn more about the work of parliamentary research services from colleagues representing parliaments of Austria, Canada, the Czech Republic, Ghana, and Pakistan. Last but not least, we would very much appreciate to hear and learn from you, dear participants. This is what communities of practice are for. To make networking not only possible, but also effective, we have assigned two interactive sessions so that all of us get a chance to share, reflect, and find new solutions to the challenges we experience in our day-to-day -day work. I won't take any more of your time. I know that my colleagues will be sharing all necessary guidance in the chat, so keep an eye on the, on the Zoom chat screen. Um, so feel free to ask any questions there and my colleagues will respond to you. I wish everybody a, a, a great session and I would like to pass the floor now to Lydia Harris, who is Senior Advisor and Physical Sciences Lead at the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology 
at the House of Commons, Westminster, United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Over to you, Lydia. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, and, and hello, everyone. It's a real uh, privilege to be able to speak to you all today. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm Lydia Harris. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I work um, in the UK Parliament at POST, which is the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. I have two roles there. Um, I lead POST's physical sciences and digital um, work section, uh, but I also lead POST's international engagement. Um, so I'm gonna just take a couple of minutes now to tell you a little bit about my team um, and then talk a bit more about our international engagement activities as well. So for those of you who aren't familiar with POST, um, we work for both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, so the upper and lower chambers in the UK Parliament. And our primary aim is helping parliamentarians and staff access scientific information and research evidence. Um, we work across um, a, bro a broad range of um, areas, um, including the physical and social sciences, energy, the environment, and biological sciences and health as well. Our activities um, include producing written briefings that are proactive and peer reviewed. We also organize events that bring in external experts into parliament. We conduct horizon scanning activities to identify topics of potential future interest to parliament. So looking ahead six months, a couple of years, 10 years um, or, 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 or even further in the future, to see what topics we think potentially may be coming onto the parliamentary agenda um, at some point. Um, and we also support other parts of parliament um, by helping them to access research evidence um, and um, expertise and, and scientific information. We are lucky enough to have a dedicated knowledge exchange unit within POST, so um, a, a team of four members of staff who uh, focus specifically on strengthening Parliament's connections with the academic research community. Um, and just to, to kind of help orientate you, um, the POST team is um, primarily funded by the parliamentary administration. So we're parliamentary staff, we're non-political appointments, um, and we're joined by approximately 20 to 30 academics each year who come on to comment to Parliament. Um, to support with our work and, and, and to take research projects. And as Jonathan mentioned, uh, Vicky and Mark are two of our um, parliamentary academic fellows um, who, you'll be, who you'll be hearing from shortly about their, um, their research. Um, POST sits alongside other teams within the UK Parliament that also perform a, a research and information um, type function. So I should mention that we have um, two research libraries, one in the House of Commons and one in, one in the House of Lords. Um, and we also have specialist staff that support um, the committees or as, as you might say, commissions um, in their inquiry work. And that's kind of in, in addition to, to the post team and the work that we do. Uh, Post's engagement with other parliaments has been an important feature of our work for at least uh, the last 15 years, probably longer. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about that to give you a flavour of the kinds of activities we've been involved in. Post was one of the founding members of the EPTA network, which stands for the European Parliamentary Technology Assessment Network. Um, and this um, is a community that brings together um, practitioners who are working in parliamentary science advice, um, offices or technology assessment offices or research and information offices, depending on what brain you, you want to use. Um, uh, and, and these offices are um, working for parliaments in countries across Europe, but also beyond. So the network has um, a, a large number of associate members um, um, based in countries beyond, the, beyond continental Europe as well. Um, and um, we have annual conferences and practitioners meetings to support with our um, exchange of information and knowledge and professional development as well. Um, Post has also partnered directly with other legislatures over the years uh, to help strengthen their scientific information and research services. Um, and in return, we've gained insights and ideas from learning about how um, other parliaments are, are approaching this work. Um, it's given us a better understanding of our own practices, made us think about what we do and why. 
Um, and we found these interactions really valuable um, opportunities for professional development for our staff as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to give you an example of three projects that we've been involved in in more recent years, um, just to give you a little bit of a, a, a flavour. Um, so we've worked with um, Congress staff and senators in the uh, National Congress in Chile, um, uh, exchanging knowledge with them, uh, providing advice and training um, as they've gone through the process of developing their science advice services within the existing structures of, of their National Congress. Um, and that's a relationship that's run for several years now. We've also worked with um, counterparts in Argentina um, We've helped to raise the profile of parliamentary science advice within the Argentine National Congress um, through similar knowledge exchange activities and events and training. Um, and that's um, contributed to supporting their journey that's led them to establish a science advice office in their chamber of deputies. Um, and we've also had um, involvement in a, a project with Spain um, that helped to support the establishment of a science advice office for the Spanish National Congress and POST was involved from the early stages um, when academics and civil servants and other stakeholders were just starting to make the case for, um, uh, for, for the value that a, a science advice office could make for the, um, uh, could offer the Spanish um, Congress, all the way through to supporting with the production of sample briefings and events to showcase uh, the concept of parliamentary science advice. And they now have a, an office that's, that's been up and running for some time. Um, I think it's fair to say historically that post international engagement, like the vast majority of um, engagement taking place across the UK Parliament, has been relatively ad hoc um, and reactive to opportunities as they've arisen. And um, so when I took over leading post international work, I wanted to produce a strategy for us to help improve our approach and make it a bit more strategic. Um, and um, this has kind of become a, a broader um, piece of strategy work. So we now have a key, um, uh, an international engagement strategy for the research and information team within the Commons. So that encompasses not just Post, but the House of Commons Library as well. Um, and in the process of, of developing this strategy for our research and information services, um, it's helped to stimulate interest in taking a more strategic approach to interparliamentary engagement across other teams within the UK Parliament as well. So notice, notably, um, the House of Commons Interparliamentary Relations Office has been leading on creating a, uh, a new interparliamentary engagement strategy, um, which, uh, which has now been launched. And that covers all activities that are led by House of Commons staff and which involve engagement with other legislators. Um, and um, this strategy has given us a, a range of uh, principles to take into account when we are engaging with other legislatures. I won't go into all of the principles now, but just to give you a little flavour, it includes things like making sure that our activities are aligning with the House of Commons strategy and its values, making sure that um, uh, activities complement existing work that other organisations may al already be undertaking. Um, and building in evaluation as well, so that we're making sure that we're learning from, from our successes and our failures and applying what we learn, not just for future engagement activities, but also um, uh, using those learnings to improve our own work and our processes in other areas of Parliament too. Um, speaking personally, um, having the opportunity to engage with counterparts from countries around the world um, at events such as these, um, sharing knowledge and experiences um, has been one of the great privileges of working at POST and I'm sure various um, POST colleagues of mine would also agree with that. Uh, we're very aware that the UK model is only one approach um, and um, we have been keen to, to be able to point um, international stakeholders that we're working with um, and, and partners in other countries towards other, legisl other legislatures other ways of doing things, other models that might be um, more relevant to their particular local context. Um, we're also um, increasingly thinking about our international activities as opportunities for two-way learning. And we recognise that there's, there's definitely more that we could do to learn more from, from others in other parliaments and other countries um, and use that to improve our own practices and work 
um, in the UK Parliament. And those are two of the reasons why we particularly wanted to undertake um, an international mapping project so that we could better understand what approaches were being taken elsewhere to parliamentary research and information um, and um, to learn from that. Um, and it's that project that our academic fellows, uh, Mark and Vicky, uh, will tell you more about in the next segment. So on that note, um, I'm going to hand over to Vicky for the next activity. Thank you so much, Lydia, and hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, my name is Dr Vicky Ward, and as Lydia said, um, I am a parliamentary academic fellow with the post team at UK Parliament. Um, I'm an academic based at the University of St Andrews in beautiful and currently sunny Scotland. Um, so that's where I spend the majority of my time. Um, so what would be brilliant, and we've already done this a little bit, um, both on microphones and in the chat as well, what would be wonderful is to see whereabouts everyone is from. <laughs> so um, in the chat, there is going to be a link to a, um, a Slido poll. So this is what we'll be using um, right through the event today, both for this exercise, but also for our Q and A's. And so what I'd like you to do is pop onto that and um, add whereabouts you are based. And I'll just give you a few minutes for that because we've got over a hundred people in the room, <laughs> so this might take a little bit of time. I just want to make sure that you see this. Yes. Or is it just, okay. Yes. It's not just you, Yulia. We can. We should all be able to see that. So quite a few people from the UK. This is also the point where we get to see the different ways that people <laughs> refer to their country. So we've got UK, United Kingdom, and I'm fairly sure I saw Sheffield popping up in there, which is a city in the north of England. Wow, that is fantastic. People who are putting their um, countries into the chat, I'm hoping that that's not because you can't access the Slido link. Um, so I'm hoping that, that that is working for you okay. If it's not working for you okay, um, say please do say so in the chat and uh, one of the technical team will try and pick that up with you. OK, so um, we've got 68 people have participated, which is absolutely fantastic. And we can see everything um, really on there from. Um, so we've got some various cities in the UK that have been named, um, but we've got someone from Bhutan. Welcome to you. It's wonderful to have you here from Albania, um, from. Oh, I can't see the side of it. Let me see. Oh, yes. Tunisia um, from um, the Seychelles. That is absolutely fantastic to have you here and Indonesia. And obviously what really strikes me about this is that there's no way that all of us could have actually met together in person. So this really helps us to demonstrate, I think, the value of actually having um, an online event, which is wonderful. And it is so super to see so many people who've chosen to join us today. And thank you so much for that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, Lydia has helpfully kind of given a little bit of a background about the work that um, Mark and I have been doing. And in this session, what we're going to do is explain a little bit more about the research work that we have been doing for POST 
And also we're going to hear from Ida, who is going to tell us more about the landscape of research services from across Europe. Um, so let me share my slides. Uh, oh, hang on. Didn't mean to do that. Best laid plans and all that's always the case, isn't it? There we go. So, so that should now be That's um, the slide. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, so, as I mentioned, my name is Vicky Ward and I am based at the University of St Andrews. Also on the call today, lurking somewhere amongst the over 100 people in the room, is Dr Mark Monaghan, who is um, based at uh, Loughborough University. And, oh, I don't know why it's done that. Sorry about that. Apologies. Um, yes, so Mark is based at Loughborough University and Mark and I have been sharing this role um, in our um, academic fellowship, which we'll be telling you a little bit more about now. Um, Mark and I come from a background where our research really focuses on um, how evidence is used in different settings. So we do research on evidence informed policy and practice. And so we come from a particular stance, I guess, when we're thinking about parliamentary research services. Mark and I see these really as an example of ways that um, academic research can move into practice and into policy. And what that means as well is that we come from slightly outside of the world of parliamentary research services. Um, so when we started our project, one of the things that we needed to do was get an understanding of what the landscape of parliamentary research services looked like and what work other people had done on this. So we started off looking at some of the literature that had been um, and the things that have been said about parliamentary research services. And these are some of the things that were said about the relationships between research and parliaments. So first of all, um, most parliaments have some form of research service, service which provides answers to questions that politicians ask. Um, so obviously all of us on the call know this. Um, so um, this isn't a surprise. But what was interesting um, was in previous work that had been done, um, the assumption was made that bodies like POST, which provide answers to questions um, that politicians need to know but don't think to ask, are the exception. And um, there's an assertion as well that around 90% of legislatures lack the kind of scientific and technology advisory systems um, that POST provide. And you've already heard from Lydia the range of services that they provide. There was another set of assumptions in this literature as well about there being this real distinction between services that provide on-demand research and services that provide more of a proactive service. That leading then to a further assumption that in-depth and long-range advice is actually beyond the capacity of on-demand services. And um, also it, there, there was some question about whether the skills of distillation and impartiality were really present in those on-demand services. And then there's this other um, assumption at the bottom that research and policy making are elite activities and in most of the global south, um, that capacity doesn't really exist and is supported by um, organisations and agencies from northern research communities. So these, I must be said, are assumptions that are present in the literature. And to start with, Mark and I very much were questioning these assumptions. And hopefully, as you'll see, as I go through the rest of the project, we feel that we've actually um, been able to critique some of those assumptions by adding some more data to um, 
to the landscape. So our project is um, a parliamentary academic fellowship, as I mentioned, and as Lizia mentioned, they, this was a commissioned call for research. Post wanted to understand what the landscape of global research services was like, um, which parts of the world there were services that they perhaps hadn't come across before, and how they could network with them. So I kind of like to think of our project as a bit of an exercise in finding Post and other research services around the world new friends. Um, Mark and I have been undertaking this work for two days a week um, since September 2021, and we each do one day. So in effect, I am half a fellow and Mark is the other half of the fellow. And early on, we decided that we needed to include a fairly broad terminology. What you probably saw from the previous assumptions is that some of the literature talks about legislative science advice or LSA. Now, we realized quite early on that this wasn't terminology that was used by very many people. And so we decided to actually broaden the terminology that we were using so that we were using quite simple terms to refer to what services were doing rather than what they might be called. And we also wanted to have quite a broad scope. So this enabled us to come up with these aims, and our aims were to explore and map the different mechanisms that parliaments across the world use to access and source research evidence. We wanted to understand what those mechanisms looked like, and also we wanted to be able to facilitate connections between different people working in those communities, and that is precisely where this event has then come from. Um, I know that not many of you will be interested in our methods and methodology, so I'm going to very quickly skim through these slides before I get on to our key, um, the key points. So basically, we started by mapping out the different mechanisms that existed. This was a big job and is why our fellowship has taken us two years. Um, we um, identified lots of potential mechanisms um, and some of those though included mechanisms that really pushed research into parliament and early on because of our focus on, um, on post and things that looked a bit like post we decided that we were going to focus on mechanisms that helped parliaments to pull research in so not academic citizen academia pushing research out but very much people with a close relationship with, with parliaments pulling that research in that could be helpful for them. Um, we found lots of different things. And then what we then needed to do then was make some kind of distinction between different things. Um, so we came up with this kind of uh, a, a loose three tiered system. And in many ways, what this represented was an opportunity for us to think about, well, what things are most likely to be working, which mechanisms are most likely to be working with academic research, because that was the aspect of this landscape that Mark and I were particularly focusing on. So up in tier one there, um, those are at the top of the slide, those are examples um, of the kinds of things that gave us a degree of confidence that the different services that we'd identified were actually engaging with academic research. The ones in the middle were doing um, important work, very important work, but the link to um, academics and academic research was maybe a little bit more uncertain from the information we managed to find and from the documents we gathered. And down at the bottom, we found some things that looked like um, they might be really promising, but then when we started digging around some more, we couldn't find very much information about things. So those ended up, um, those were our lowest level of confidence. Um, so that was um, how we ended up doing our initial mapping. Um, Mark and I are qualitative researchers, so we also did some interviews. Um, and thank you so much to those of you on the call today who took the time to be interviewed by either Mark or myself. We very much appreciate it. And this is just to let you know that we are still working with that data. <laughs> so we still have a way to go in terms of analysing those interviews and are expecting some more interesting things to come out um, from that moving forward. 
But today, what we really wanted to share with you was the map. So um, here is a QR code that will take you straight to the map. It is hosted on the International Interparliamentary Engagement Network um, platform at the moment. It's a Google map, so you should be able to access it relatively easily and zoom in to see what is there. I think on the map at the moment, we've got about 76 different services from right across the world. And um, what you should also be able to see is that if you click on one of the little flags, you get a little bit of a description. So you'll get a description of the research service, of what they do, and where we can, a web link as well to their own website. Now, on the map, we haven't included all 183 mechanisms that we potentially found. <laughs> that would just have got too crazy um, and very much too busy. But also, we wanted to focus on those mechanisms where we had the most um, confidence that they were engaging with academic research. And so those are the ones that are on the map. And so I think we've got around 76 on there at the moment. What I'd like to say is that if your mechanism is not represented on the map, please tell us, um, drop us an email and we can update the map. This is a live map still. Um, so you can still do that. Um, so just to round off, um, this is um, some of the some, these are some of the insights that we've built from building the map of parliamentary research services. Um, so you remember that there was an assertion that 90% of parliaments around the world legislatures didn't have um, a mechanism for accessing and handling research. Well, um, we found a very different picture. We found that most parliaments do have a mechanism for accessing and handling research, but a lot of their activities are hidden. It's quite difficult to find out what these services are doing, what you are all doing in your work. So it's not that you're, you don't exist, it's that um, very little is known um, about what the work that you do. We did find though as well that lots of you and lots of people working research services struggle to access academic publications and databases. So this is a common um, this is a common concern. We also found that a lot of the different services do on demand and proactive work at the same time. And Lydia actually gave an example of that with Post doing some much more proactive work, but the, the House of Commons and Lords Library services tending to do reactive work. And we found that many services actually did both of those things. And obviously, if you're doing both of those things, you're using the same skills, principles and activities to carry out both. And then the other thing that we found is that there is already a strong network of organisations focusing on providing and strengthening evidence use in parliaments. So we found that lots of services already connect with one another, perhaps in certain geographical locations, and that you use these and other routes to share knowledge and learn from one another already. Um, but obviously that picture is quite patchy. And so that's the idea behind trying to bring as many people as possible together today to actually um, give you a chance to meet one another, to see other people from different parts of this landscape and get to understand what one another does. So I'm hoping that um, the, um, that's given you a good flavour of our research. I should have said as well at the start of my presentation, and apologies for this, please do use the Slido um, for any questions that you have, either for us or for Ida. Um, and at the end of this little section, we will be looking at some of those questions. The way that you can use Slido is you can put in your own question there. Um, but you can also vote for other people's questions if that's something that you would like answered as well. And then we will take the top questions towards the end of the session. Um, but here's some questions for you. Um, so we um, we have, have really want to think about how we can 
engage, how we can um, change the resources and how we can make them useful in the future. And in the session after this, when we put you into some breakout rooms, these are some questions that it would be great if you could consider. So what surprised you about our map? Um, do you think it's useful? <laughs> Will you use it? And how do you think it could be improved? So we'd love to hear more from you about that. But for now, what I'm going to do is hand, stop sharing my screen for a start and then hand over to Ida, who is going to give us a little bit more of a focused picture on what parliamentary research services look like in European countries. So over to you, Ida. Thank you, Vicky, very much. And uh, uh, hi, everybody from all around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My task is today twofold. On the one hand, to introduce you the ECPRD, the European Center for Parliamentary Research and Documentation. And on the other hand, to give an overview on the parliamentary research services across Europe. Uh, Julia, please share my slide and we can move to the first. One. Just a second, we will do this right now. Okay, I can continue. So first about the ECPRD. Uh, ECPRD is a European regional parliamentary cooperation. It was established in 1977 in Vienna by the Conference of Speakers of European Parliamentary Assemblies. According to the statutes, members are the two European level supranational parliaments, the European Parliament, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and national parliaments. Altogether, 63 parliamentary chambers from 52 countries. ECPRD also includes some more parliaments outside the Europe having observers such as uh, the United States and Canada and partners for democracy status like Jordan, Kazakhstan, and Morocco. The objectives of ECPRD are to promote the exchange of information, ideas, experience, and good practice among the administrations of parliaments in Europe, to strengthen close cooperation among parliamentary services in all fields of parliamentary administration, including, of course, the research, and to collect, exchange, and publicize to studies produced by parliamentary services. There are four different areas of interest, economic and budgetary efforts, ICT, information and communication technologies in parliaments, parliamentary practice and procedure, and last but not least, libraries, research services, and archives. ECPRD and each area of interest uh, has two main types of activities, seminars on topical subjects, by areas of interest, including, of course, research services. This is very similar to other international organizations for parliamentary research and libraries. And regular information exchange via so-called comparative requests. This one is a unique activity compared with other international organizations. In the next slide, you can see the scheme of the workflow of comparative requests. The parliaments can send requests to all or selected members in English, mainly, via the ECPRD website. The address parliaments provide their answer to the questions via the website again. And as a result, the previous requests and answers are available on the website as a treasury of information on the parliaments and the policy issues of European countries. Next slide, please. Annually, there used to be around 300, 350 requests, two main types of them. Requests on policy issues, for example, criminal law, taxation, health, education, defense, transport, or tourism. They have their origin in the political agenda of the parliament and their members. They stand for around 65%. Around 35% of the requests deal with the procedural and administrative matters related to the functioning of parliaments. For example, the status of the members, rules of parliamentary procedures, organization, including research service, of course, and staff. Based on 
some of the latest comparative requests, I'm going to give an overview on the parliamentary research services across Europe. Please note, I have used different questionnaires with different number of addressed parliaments. Uh, uh, also, the response rate is different regarding different questionnaires and even different questions within a questionnaire. As a result, the different aspects of its introduction cover different number and different circle of research services. Despite of these, the results let us being acquainted with the different and the most common solutions in European research services. We can move to the next slide. Uh, not all parliamentary chambers have a research service. Some bicameral parliaments have a single parliamentary administration serving both houses, including the research service, for example, in Austria, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Ireland. They are research services, services operating within the administration of one of the chambers and serve both houses. This is the case, for example, in Czechia. In some chambers, there is not a research service as a separate unit, but the information and research services for members are provided either by the library, for example, at Belgian Senate and Serbia, or by the staff of the standing committees, for example, French National Assembly. The first research service, services were established in United Kingdom at House of Commons in 1945 at German Bundestag in 1949, and in Finland in 1956. From uh, 1960 to 1989, research services were launched in further seven parliamentary chambers. You can see a kind of boom of research services after 1990s. This is a result of democratization in Central and Eastern Europe out of 13 research services uh, established in this period. Uh, established in this period, 11 were launched in former socialist countries. Seven research services were established after 2000. The last one started to operate in Armenia and Latvia in 2017. We can move to the next slide. Out of 29 responding research services to one of the questionnaires, 76% uh, operate with less than 20 staff members nine have less than 10, and 10 have between 10 and 20 staff members. The biggest research services among respondents are at the Greek parliament with around 60, the German Bundestag with 70, and the Polish House of Representatives with 91 staff members. In addition to this, we can mention research services of the House of Commons in United Kingdom, the Italian Chamber of Deputies and the uh, Israeli Parliament having more than 50 uh, staff members. Next slide, please. Almost all research services produce several research products. It means each of the, the 16 respondents reported on 58 product lines it means each of them produces more than three different types in average. The most frequent uh, types, as you can see in the chart, the short briefings and longer analysis, such comparative and in-depth analysis. They account for 65% of all ma uh, mentioned background materials. The overwhelming majority of research services, 96% publish, publishes their research papers with, without or with some limitations. The most important criterion of publicity is the origin of the papers. Out of 25 responding research services, eight do not publish research papers prepared on demand of members, considering them confidential. So they publish only proactive papers. Six of them publishes reactive papers as well, but only with the consent of the ordering member or committee. The chart cannot express the wide variety of different practices. There are some special cases for limitation of publication. In some, mainly Scandinavian countries, the research service publishes on-demand papers only if the member ordering the research refers to it publicly, either during the parliamentary debate or in media. In some, mainly Western Balkan countries, the ordering member can object the publication 
only for limited time, one to three months, depending on their country. In some cases, the on-demand papers became public automatically after a certain period of time, for example, one month, letting the ordering member enjoying the political benefit of exclusive information for only limited time. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the initiative and the follow-up of the research request. Most of the research services, 74%, prepares pre papers proactively as well on in their own initiative, in addition to members' requests. The number and share of the proactive papers depends on the number of members' inquiries, uh, the existing capacities of the research services, and sometimes on the regulation of the research work at particular parliaments. The proactive research work is particularly, particularly useful at the beginning of a new parliamentary term to introduce and promote the research service, and then launching a new product line in order to make members acquainted with it. Usually, there are no formal criteria for deciding to prepare proactive papers or products. The research services choose topics for such papers according to the legislative program of the parliament, policy interest of the members and committees, and hot topics on the public agenda. The other chart shows the different practices of research services in collecting feedback. Seven of the respondents, 28%, uh, do not collect feedback from their clients at all. Eight of them receive spontaneous feedback from their clients in person by phone or via email. In three parliaments, they are regular user satisfaction surveys on the whole administration, including the research service. And around one quarter of the research services used to make regular action in order to collect feedback from their users. Some of them ask feedback on each paper they deliver to clients. Some organize regular annual or once in the parliamentary period written or online surveys and or personal interviews in order to measure the visibility of the research service, the satisfaction of the users with the services and products, and the further needs of the members. The last slide, please. Uh, the last slide shows external research contacts of parliamentary research services. Around one third of them outsource a part of the research work to external specialists, mainly on contractual basis, in case of lack of capacity or in the case of questions requiring special professional knowledge. At the same time, around two thirds of parliamentary research services have formal or informal collaboration with external research bodies, such as the Academy of Science, research institutions and universities. The main goal and benefit of such collaborations are, as we know from the question and from the answers to the questionnaire, getting to know new scientific results and literature, and in some cases, common research. The colleagues in the second part of the workshop will introduce you their practice in this field, uh, not just from parliaments of Europe, but other sides of the world as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ida, Vicky, Mark, uh, if you are here, would you like to take the floor and maybe we could open the session of the Q&A's. Yep, I can do that. Sorry, Vicky, I didn't, that was a <laughs> delay. There's Mark. Uh, that's all right. Um, so I've been having a look at the, the Slido. Um, and there's some really interesting questions that have come through uh, from that route as well. Um, so if we take some of the the, um, the ones from the Slido first, and then if there's time at the end, we could open it up to the floor. Does that sound like a good plan? Um, so the first one, as you can see, the most anonymous one, Vicky, this might be one for you and, and for me, but I'll ask it so you have to answer it. Um, would you consider making the data behind the map publicly available? Um, and is the list of the parliaments and their websites uh, 
or the data that in question is the parliaments, their websites, and the basic information about our findings. So, oh, um, I guess, um, yeah, there's no reason that we can't do that. Um, but the um, it's just a simple spreadsheet that sits behind the map. So that is relatively easy for us to share. Um, if people would like that um, for a particular reason, just get in touch with us and we can arrange that. At the moment, we haven't made any plans for hosting um, it online somewhere in an accessible format, but certainly that is something for Mark and I to think about. So thank you very much. Um, the basic information about our findings um, at the moment, we have information on the IPEN website, and we've also got a number of different blog posts that are out there, as well as an article in the Parliamentarian that appeared um, last year. So do please um, check that out. And later on, I can share some links for some of those other resources as well, if that's helpful. Great stuff. Thank you, Vicky. And um... Could you say a bit more about the, the the filters that we put on it in terms of how we uh, decided whether or not to include networks like ECPRD uh, to IFLA and so on? Yeah, so at the moment we don't have those networks. Um, partly because it's difficult to actually pinpoint them on the map because they're networks. <laughs> what we may be able to do though here is to include details about whether the different services that are on the map are members of those networks. That ought to be relatively straightforward to do, she says, having not checked if it is. Um, so that would be something that that we could include there. I don't know about how we add filters that people can filter by different things, um, but you can do searches um, on the map that will include particular things that um, have a search term It's in the description that you're looking for. Um, but that is certainly something that we will consider. So thank you very much for that suggestion and we will look into it. Just go through with one more. Could you scroll up? Sorry. Uh, so, a question from Sarah Swift. I think this is to Ida. Is there a way for devolved parliaments or assemblies to engage directly with ECPRD? Uh, the UK is eligible for membership, but our devolved parliaments, such as those in Scotland, Wales, and the Northern Irish Assembly, don't seem to be. So, you're on mute. Okay. So as I have mentioned, we have a statute, uh, uh, and this statute is uh, uh, approved by the Conference of Speakers of European Parliamentary Assemblies. And uh, recently, the statute states that uh, uh, the members of ECPRD, the parliamentary chambers, where the president is a member of the European Conference of Presidents of Parliament, that means the national parliament. So uh, that is why, unfortunately, my my uh, answer is no. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, of course, via your uh, uh, national network and via the members of ECPRD, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, uh, 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 contribution to to ask questions and to benefit uh, on the answers. Thank you. Thank you. How are we doing for time, Yuli? Are we okay? I, I think we can take one more question. And then the suggestion for me would be that we can bring this discussion to breakout groups when uh, we'll have less people in one room. So probably more uh, space to discuss this. Okay. Shall I select one then? Um, how about... Uh, okay. Um... Vicky, going back to you, can you elaborate on your slide when you say it's difficult to work out what some of the mechanisms are doing because their activities are hidden? Yeah. Um, 
So the approach that Mark and I used in order to um, get the information from the map was initially web searching. Now, I'm sure that most of you uh, know in the room that um, web searching, you, you're entirely reliant on what um, different parliaments put on their websites. And so actually, we found that there are a number of different services that exist that we simply couldn't find. Um, and these were things that, that we, we knew of. Um, so it was really difficult for us to include them in the map. And if we didn't then have some engagement from that parliament, then it, we couldn't add it. Um, and so really, because because they're, because services are quite hidden from general view, um, it means that they're not under they're not well understood either by members of the public um, or by academics who are looking at how parliaments use research. Um, so that was quite an interesting finding. And a good example of this as well was that I was recently at the IFLA um, Parliament conference where I met Ida as well as several other people who are here today and um, that was in The Hague and at that meeting we discovered that the Netherlands has a very well developed um, service but wasn't on our map because we couldn't find it on the um, on the Parliament's website and it, it was fairly hidden. Um, so I think it it's generally the sense that everyone is so busy doing the work that um, communicating the work about the work that, that is happening outside of the parliament tends to be further down the agenda. Um, and so it's difficult really for people outside to find out that these services even exist. And that's why I think we ended up with statements about 90% of legislatures not really having anything. Um, so hopefully that's that's made that clearer um in terms of of how and why that's hidden perfect thank you uh julia shall i hand over to you to thank you uh, so I think it's time that we could move to breakout sessions. Uh, my colleague Carlotta will share a, a bit of instructions that's very easy. Uh, we will be randomly allocated to breakout rooms. We'll have three, one with Mark, one with Vicky, and one with Ida. Uh, you will have access to control similar to the meeting. You can mute, unmute, switch on and off your videos and messages in chat. Uh, we encourage you to switch on your camera, of course, but feel free to do as you wish. Uh, in 20 minutes, you will be automatically brought back to the main room. And one important thing, if, if you would like to change the room, because you will be uh, assigned automatically, please join back the main room and I'll be here and uh, I will do my best uh, to make sure that you will get to a different room. And now if you could just please, please give me maybe one minute. Uh, and then all of us can meet in three breakout rooms. Welcome back in the main room. For those who have rejoined, let's wait a little bit for others to come back. How was it? Not enough time, Julia. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was about to say that I uh, should probably give you 30 se seconds, you know, to reflect on what you've heard in the breakout groups. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's all good because actually I think it's the start of a conversation that we'll then be able to carry on in the other breakout groups um, a bit later, I'm sure. And um, it's just lovely to to see people connecting with one another and learning from one another as well. So that's that's it's really super. That's great to hear. So I'm not sure if we have everyone back in the room. I hope we do. To me, it looks like yes. Uh, so if Mark and Ida are also here, maybe you could give us, you know, again, 30 seconds reflection on what, what you've heard uh, in the breakout groups. Happy for Ida to go first if she'd like to. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, uh, we discussed uh, uh, 
two different things. On the one hand, the different practices of research services concerning the recruitment of the staff and the, and the, and the quality of the staff. Uh, uh, also, uh, the uh, parliamentary. Also, the uh, I, this was was my question. The collaboration with the academics. Uh, also, we have heard a short introduction to the Canadian uh, Research Service, and uh, uh, we uh, were speak about uh, Christoph introduced the the uh, ECPRT. Uh, area of interest, uh, parliamentary practice and procedure, and the main type of the request concerning the parliament, uh, concerning the the uh, yes, the parliamentary uh, uh, practices. Thank you. Briefly, much either Mark. Yeah, ours ours was really interesting discussion. We had sort of three main points uh, of conversation. I think the first one was around the different kinds of networks that exist that colleagues may be part of. And we heard some examples, uh, particularly from colleagues in North America, of different sort of fellowship, uh, fellowship systems and, and uh, open sort of competitions for how people can get funding to be part of, uh, of research networks feeding into Parliament. So that was a, a, an interesting model. The, the bulk of the the discussion was taken up with uh, whether there would be anything that we could do to facilitate a more streamlined way of sharing knowledge on research that's already taken place in particular parliaments on particular topics so that colleagues are not re necessarily replicating studies, can find studies from elsewhere, that are written for sort of parliamentary audiences. Um, so we discussed that. We, we discussed also some of the, the potential pitfalls of that and how some things get lost in translation. Some things are very sort of context specific. But as a general principle, is there a, is there a platform or is there a, any kind of infrastructure that, that exists or could be developed that acts as a kind of repository for research services that are, so research outputs that are produced by uh, research services in Parliament? And then very, very briefly at the end, we heard of some new sort of services that are emerging that won't yet be on the map. So a colleague from, uh, a colleague from Kosovo told us what's going on in, in, their, in their jurisdiction and also a couple of gaps that were highlighted that Italy is not currently on our map and uh, there is some missing, uh, missing data, we think, from South America as well. So if anybody can help us fill those, fill those spaces, we are always happy to keep adapting this, and and it's an evolving, it's an evolving picture. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Vicky and Ida. Um, we are running a little bit late, but not that much. So my suggestion would be that in one minute we go for a short break. Uh, so I suggest that we meet at uh, two four. 240 if that's fine with you mm, that's going to be 10 minutes late as per our agenda but i hope that we'll uh, be able uh, to find time uh, later and meanwhile i would like to share a very short video with you uh, from international idea which presents a very interesting and useful tool democracy tracker and then i will leave uh, all of us uh, for 10 minutes uh, in peace and we'll meet you here uh, in as i said 2 40 pm brussels time International IDEA has developed the Democracy Tracker, a policy-oriented tool that monitors and alerts audiences to events influencing democracy and human rights around the world on a monthly basis. The Democracy Tracker is part of International IDEA's Global State of Democracy Initiative, which analyzes the condition of democracy and human rights in 173 countries. The Democracy Tracker is organized by country profile pages, which includes basic background facts and the ratification status of human rights treaties. Each profile page features monthly updates spotlighting events that merit attention and intervention due to their impact on democracy and human rights. 
The monthly updates are coded to show what specific aspects of democracy are impacted and are tagged with keywords to enable further research. On the Democracy Trackers website, users can also consult international ideas publications. You can explore all these elements on our website, idea.int slash democracy tracker. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the next session um, where we are going to hear from various different colleagues um, talking about how they engage with academic research within their own um, jurisdiction. So we've got, I think, three, four, seven different uh, colleagues going to talk to us in, in this session. Um, all right, so I hope you enjoyed your, your coffee, your tea, or your or soothing nightcap, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and the first talk we have now is from colleagues in Austria, Christoph, uh, on how the research service in Austria engages with academic research. So um, the floor is your over. Julia, is the, um, are there slides for this one? Uh, yes, but I think that Christoph, oh, Christoph is ah, already sharing. Right on cue. Thank, Thank you, much. Christoph. Okay, so we've got Christoph Conrad. We've got about six minutes, Christoph, for your, for your presentation. So we'll work on this for six minutes for each. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Christoph Conrad, and I work in the Legal, Legislative and Research Service of the Austrian Parliament. We will talk about our engagement with academic research and academics in Austria. What is important to know about Austria is that we work in a very much party-centered environment with very strong parliamentary party groups who historically have dominated not just parliamentary practice and procedure, but have also fully catered to members while the parliamentary administration was for a long time regarded as just someone who sort of makes all the infrastructure available. Therefore, due to this history, the parliamentary administration in Austria lacks a formal statutory guarantee of independence. So there is no law about parliamentary administration or ordinance or something like this. We have been engaged in more and more research work for the needs of parliamentarians and parliamentary groups and parliament as such for the last 15 years or so. And to strengthen our neutrality and the excellence of research, we must always prove this through concrete working practices starting from communication with groups and members, committees, the speakers, to transparency, sort of what do we publish and how do we do this? How do we explain what we do, the sources we use, the methods we use? An import, so saying this, we are still a very young institution that has grown over the last years. Today, 33 experts, um, work in the parliamentary research, legislative uh, and research services, but those experts are not doing exclusively research. They support budgetary and legal affairs, as well as the communication and education efforts of the Austrian parliament. So the spectrum is very broad. And when you look at sort of what people who would do full-time research, we are about 10, uh, including the budget. In such a context, excellence must be grounded in a constant dialogue with academia and research institutions. As has been stated already, there are a lot of fields we cannot cover. There are a lot of fields of expertise where uh, we don't have the proper background or the specialist knowledge. And therefore, we strive to have a constant exchange with academia to, uh, and to be actively involved in academic research, publications, and teaching. So although we have a small number of people, we try to get 
them and support that they are doing uh, courses at university, that we cooperate with universities and other research institutions and publication projects. You just see a small selection. This is one thing that we have published together with ECBRD, a book on parliaments and constitutional courts. We have been actively involved in the Routledge Handbook of Parliamentary Administrations. I'm one of the editors of the International Journal of Parliamentary Studies. And there are some research projects that we have projects that we have recently collaborated with. Um, we think that this is important to, to help academics who do work about parliament to better understand the, the institutions and its work, to be open-minded and to, to get inspiration from academics, but also to share our knowledge and be open. We, we heard before that it's often very difficult to access parliamentary knowledge. But what is it so important for this is that we have to define our roles. What are we? Are we pro just providers of information? We are also public employees and that's part of the administration and administrations tend to be sort of rather closed in, in many instances. And we are experts in our fields of studies. And this is one of the sort of the most difficult tasks we fa face. And especially as we work in an interdisciplinary environment and try to uh, encourage interdisciplinary thinking and cooperation. What is important for us that we make all these issues transparent and have a reflective attitude. When we manage this, we can have an integrative explanatory and democratic function with a wider impact. What I mean by this is that we support people who do research about democracy, who do research about work about, uh, work about parliaments, but also policy uh, studies and uh, research work that has an impact on politics. And that we have to uh, explain the things we do, especially as the practice and workings of parliaments, are often quite obscured to outsiders. And just to give you a few examples of uh, our work, I will now hand over to my colleague, Christoph Kerr. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Christoph. And um, thank you for giving us the chance uh, to speak on a few parliamentary research initiatives, as we call them. Um, we've only launched uh, this year. It's kind of a package of initiatives, which um, as a whole um, is supposed to promote parliamentary um, research and facilitate networking um, among researchers with kind of the aim of uh, positioning also ourselves as hub for research, focusing on parliaments, and of course also to keep up to date. The starting point you can also already see on the slide um, I've got only one minute left, uh, was the compilation of a digital bibliography focusing on research literature that is dealing with parliaments. Um, the next point um, is uh, open data. So that our parliament publicly provides data and aims at simple usability. Um, in a cooperation with the University of Vienna, we make use of this data and provide selected showcases. Another initiative is uh, the so-called research year in Parliament, where our service selects a research project and gives a research the possibility to work on it for one year with the full support of uh, experts of the parliamentary administration. And the last one is the day of parliamentary research. Um, I will give you more inputs on the next slide. But uh, to make sure all of these initiatives are accompanied by a whole lot of activities from social media, um, from direct contact with universities, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the day of parliamentary research? It's a one day academic conference, including experts and practitioners. And so our call, you, see, you, can, you can see one picture um, for contributions, um, was very much focusing on inter and transdisciplinarity. So if you will see our call um, very in a few months, please uh, feel invited to also um, hand in proposals. It's not only for academics from universities, but also from administrations and all the other institutions. Uh, we had keynote speeches from political science and law. And uh, there you can see that there was also the um, 
public attention on this, uh, really because the Austria, Austrian Broadcasting Corporation brought a very long interview with one of our keynote speakers on their website. Um, there were interdisciplinary panels, and we can tell you that the interdisciplinary discussion really worked well. Um, and I have to stop here already. Um, I just can tell you that the interest was really um, high. We had to cut, and um, we could have had more participants because the interest was high. Uh, anyway, we hope to see you there next year and keep up uh, our, your interest on our work. There are a few links. Um, if you're interested in how we tried to engage and try to organize all these initiatives I tried to tell you about right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christoph and Christoph. Really helpful and useful introduction to the situation in, in Austria. Moving on, uh, we have colleagues joining us from Canada who are going to tell us about the, the Canadian context. Good morning, and uh, I just want to introduce my colleague Lalita Acharya, who will be speaking on behalf of the Library of Parliament. And Lalita is our Senior Director, Economics, Resources and Environment Division. And I will pass it over to Lalita to, to run through the slides. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for that introduction. And good morning, everybody from the Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada. So before I provide you with some information about how the library's research services engage with uh, academic research, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the library's research and analysis services to provide you with some context. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. So the Library of Parliament is a separate parliamentary institution that serves both Houses of Parliament, the Senate and the House of Commons, and its research uh, services are located in what is called the Research and Education Service Area that has uh, an information research and analysis function for parliamentary clients and also a wing that provides public education programs on behalf of Parliament and uh, also provides seminars for parliamentarians and their staff. Dedicated research services have been provided by the library since 1965. And those uh, information and research services are provided by employees who are uh, experts in their respective fields, uh, includes librarians, lawyers, scientists, GIS specialists, economists, um, political and social scientists. <clears throat> the research divisions currently have about 140 staff members providing those services. And the frontline research staff are supported by senior managers who review all research documents uh, for parliamentary clients. Next slide, please. So the library provides a variety of research products and services to uh, individual parliamentarians and in both English or uh, English and French or English or French, depending upon the request. And they, these services are highlighted on this slide. And in recent years, there has been more emphasis on comparative, intersectional and statistical analysis, as well as on data visualization. And that reflects uh, increased demand and expectations in this area. Next slide, please. Um, the Library of Parliament is one of only a handful of legislative libraries in the world that provides dedicated research support to parliamentary committees and parliamentary associations. Analysts, research and analysts are, are assigned to committees and associations and they provide a variety of products and services and I've highlighted a few of them in this slide <clears throat> and most importantly perhaps um, are the committee reports the the first draft is produced by analysts under the direction of the committee next slide please the library also proactively produces a number of research publications that are available to parliamentarians and the public and those are outlined on this slide. I draw your attention in particular to one of our most popular products, legislative summaries. And those are plain language summaries of uh, certain bills before parliament. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to focus now on the ways that we engage with uh, different types of research, including academic research. And this slide illustrates the range of information and research, research sources, excuse me, that are used by re research division staff to provide evidence-based research to our parliamentary clients. Primary sources are the default source. Media reports are cited only when no other information source is found or if there is a request from a parliamentary client for uh, a media scan, for example. Uh, frontline staff apply an intersectional lens in the selection of resources to ensure that information from relevant stakeholders and population groups is considered. Uh, in particular, in the Canadian context, uh, that includes publications and data from Indigenous stakeholders and scholars. The potential of partisan bias is always considered when selecting resources, academic or not. And the um, academic research is, is routinely cited in research conducted for individual parliamentarians and in the library's research publications that I mentioned in, the early, in an earlier slide. Now, the extent of research conducted uh, depends on deadlines that are given to staff for work. Also, research staff are often juggling uh, multiple projects. So sometimes it's only a few hours um, for a short request or a few days for a longer request. Uh, this does um, influence how much information and research we can provide, provide to clients. Academics often appear as witnesses before parliamentary committees and their testimony is cited in committee reports and in research publications and projects for parliamentary clients. And analysts uh, sometimes provide lists of set suggested witnesses to parliamentary committees upon request and academics often feature in those lists. And finally, the names of academics are also proposed by analysts for certain association activities. Next slide, please. So with that, I will leave you, uh, Yulia, if you could just um, move to the next slide, please. Well, I, there we are. Uh, there's a, a beautiful view of uh, the Library of Parliament's dome. Um, so I will close my, com my remarks with that slide. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much for doing a lot behind the scenes here to uh, to keep the speakers in mind. But hopefully, if there's anything that's that's cropping up um, from what our colleagues have said, then we can follow that up in networking sessions after. We'll endeavour to share any sort of information on request after as well. So the next uh, talk is from our colleagues from the Czech Republic, Czechia, uh, and I think it's Stefan who's going to join us from, uh, the, from the Czech Republic talk us through the research service in the Czech Parliament. Hi, uh, Stefan. I think you're muted. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so that's fine. And can you can you visit my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so again, uh, good afternoon from Prague uh, to all time zones, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to present uh, our experience with uh, engaging with academic research. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit the Parliamentary Institute, uh, which is uh, a research service, but uh, the scope of our activities uh, is a little bit broader. Uh, the current structure uh, we have uh, is that we have the four departments, the general analysis department, it's the pure parliamentary research, 
Uh, so it means that this department provides to individual MPs, uh, group of political groups or the committees or commissions uh, information on request, but also uh, from our own initiative. Um, we cover in this department of political right. science, international relations. We used to cover also economics, constitutional and public law mainly. Then we have a EU, uh, EU Affairs Department, which uh, is expert uh, background for the Committee on European Affairs. This department deals mainly with EU legislation and with EU policies and EU law. It's a um, very good um, synergy between the European Affairs and the general analysis, because it also gives to us the view how European Affairs are going to be developed in the future. And uh, we can also include this research into the uh, general analysis. Then First we have the really department. Sorry to jump in. Apologies, uh, but could you uh, start presenting? Because I think that some of the colleagues can't see the slides changing. So if you go to presenters mode. That should be present in uh, the upper menu. Yes, I have. I am sharing. Uh, okay, maybe I could ask um, if it's fine with you. Maybe I could ask my colleague Carlotta to do this okay, for you us, can. and then Thanks. you can say next slide, please, and we'll do this. Yes, thank you very much, Carlotta. It works fine. Thank you. Uh, so the Communication and Education Department uh, deals with the publishing activities, public outreach, history of parliamentarism, uh, and uh, organized seminars and workshops. And recently, we have also budget and economic analysis, which uh, this department is um, intended to offer to MPs uh, expert background uh, or back, uh, expert support to the budget functions, uh, possibly regulatory impact assessment, and you know, economical department, uh, economical questions uh, as such. May I ask for next slide, please? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to to thank the authors uh, of the answers uh, number twelve and number eighty five uh, in the workshop registration uh, registration form because uh, they helped me to, um, to find the most important uh, topics for discussion about the connections between the parliamentary and uh, academic uh, research. So uh, I don't know who is the author, uh, who is the author of this uh, answer, but thank you very much, uh, mainly, uh, mainly uh, for the second one, making parliamentary research less academic. Uh, I would like to, to speak a little bit more about that. But first of all, if you can uh, show the next slide, please. Uh, I would like to, uh, to share with you our experience uh, with our cooperation with uh, academia, with uh, the academic um, institutions. Uh, why uh, the parliament needs uh, to have the contact with uh, academic uh, institutions because the parliament decides for future. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of uh, new scientific uh, research or resu results of the scientific research if it's, uh, and it's uh, really needed to communicate these results to members of the parliament. And still we'll have to uh, take into account that uh, in many aspects, the MPs are not the professionals in many, in, uh, many subjects. So uh, it's very important to uh, communicate the results in a way which is understandable and digestible for MPs. So it means that there, is, there must be something like translation of the scientific uh, knowledge into the public policies concept or pu public policy concepts, and then into the parliament's legislative decision making and oversight functions. That's the need of the parliament. And because we are uh, the service for parliamentarians, so it, uh, it means that we have to reflect this, this need of the parliament. In um, the Czech Republic, we now uh, are in a situation that uh, there is, uh, you know, some interest of the uh, 
academic institutions to cooperate with the parliamentarians. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we have uh, something like the virtual scientific hub of academics, which is called CIRI, National uh, Institute. And uh, this is the group uh, and uh, some gathering of academics uh, that would like to cooperate with the, uh, with the parliament. Uh, then we have uh, Czech priorities, which is the team of Czech and international experts. Uh, combining knowledge of uh, basic and applied research, and also this hub or this 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 group of experts would like to communicate to the parliament the results of uh, the sign of the scientific research, and also they they would like to change the system how uh, how uh, in the Czech Republic we organize uh, the the public policies how we how we formulate the public policies. So it means that from this point of view, uh, we try to be also engaged and to cooperate with, with them. Uh, but still, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky how to communicate or how to, how to um, communicate with MPs. Uh, one solution is uh, to uh, create a committee for future but uh, it's still not working uh, in, the, in the Czech Republic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to, uh, to speak a little bit about the differences be, uh, between the academic and the parliamentary research and how to make the parliamentary research less academic, because we have to uh, translate uh, the academic, uh, no, academic knowledge and academic language uh, into the understandable way for, for MPs. So I'm not the author of this table or of this, of this metrics, but I think that this matrix shows very clearly how can we make uh, parliamentary research less academic and what we can do if we want to deliver the academic uh, research to MPs. Uh, we have to simplify. Very important goal for the parliamentary research is to simplify and to, but to simplify uh, the way how we communicate our language, but not the content, which is tricky and the most important and very difficult uh, difficult uh, topic for us. We must be descriptive. We must uh, we must present the overview of potential options, summaries, or the policy options. That is what the research service uh, should do in this uh, in this topic. Uh, because, for, uh, please, next slide, uh, we still uh, have to uh, take into account the main principles of the parliamentary research, that we have to be clear, useful for MPs, impartial, complete, and we have to offer our, uh, our services on time. Because, as it was mentioned by our Austrian colleagues, we are the public, ser we are public uh, service, and um, that's uh, the most important thing for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful, and lots of food for thought in the, in the presentation as well. Uh, next, we have colleagues from uh, Ghana joining us to tell us um, about the, the research service in the Ghanaian context. Um, should we remind speakers as well, it's seven, seven minutes if possible. We put the presentation up, Julian. Yes, thank you so much. I'm just putting the slides on. My colleague right. already. Okay. I hope you can hear me now. We can. Good afternoon. Um, I present on the engagement with academic research, the case of parliamentary service. Research Service of Ghana. Next slide. So I will be looking at this format by way of introduction, the role of academic research in uh, building strong parliaments. We'll also be looking at how Parliament of Ghana engages the academic community. And then we'll be looking at the main factors that him inhibits parliament access and use of academic research. And then we look at the way forward, how to build strong relationship with the academic research community. 
Okay. Right, by way of introduction, we're looking at academic engagement as a whole process where legislatures seek to bring in academic research into legislation to assist in the performance of the functions of parliament. Clearly, the, the ability of any member of parliament, and for that matter, the entire parliament, to perform its roles largely depends on the extent to which it has uh, access to authoritative and reliable information. Early academic research appears to be most authoritative and credible just because of the, the rigorous scientific methods that underpins academic research. And therefore, many parliaments will want to have access to academic research to be able to be effective in the performance of their mandate, both legislation, scrutiny, and then debate. The more you have access to academic research, what it means is that debate can focus on the differences in values rather than the facts that are available. Because as far as the facts are concerned, there are no disagreement. And so many, many decisions that may, may be taken by parliaments can be so, as can be generally acceptable if they are based on academic uh, research. Next. Now, when you come to Parliament of Ghana, there are so many ways that we engage academia in order to have a, access to information. We have so many, but the key ones are what I've put down here to discuss. The first one is we have what we call the post-budget workshop. This particular one has to do with dealing with the budget, the national budget, when it is you know, presented to the floor of the house. Usually, uh, parliament would go out after the presentation, and then engage the academic institutions, engage think tanks, engage civil society, to analyze and present the budget from their perspectives. And this largely informs the debate of the budget when Parliament gets back to the floor of the house to approve the, the, the budget for the executive. The second most important means is what we call quarterly seminar series. This is a platform established by the research department of Parliament to, 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 to engage think tanks and academia to share their new research findings with the research department, which can also use it to support the work of, of the house. Then the third one is the speaker's seminar lecture series. It's one key activity that is under the purview of the Speaker of Parliament. And it has to do with an annual lecture series where topical issues are raised and then the academia is invited to Parliament to discuss these issues from their perspectives. And that goes a long way to improve upon the information knowledge about uh, of members of parliament and the house as a whole. Then the fourth one that we do is that in Ghana's parliament, research department has what we call annual research week. In, uh, during this week, a whole week is set aside for research department to showcase its products. And as it showcases the products that it has, it invites academic institutions. It also invites think tanks. It invites uh, civil society organizations to come and exhibit the products that they have so that members of parliament and the house as a whole will know which academic institution has what information. And anytime such information are needed, they can easily you know, call on them to, to have access to it. Next slide. Now, in recent times, as a part of the efforts to widen the collaboration with academic research, Ghana's parliament has established two key departments. In addition to the existing research department and library, they have established the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology just 
like what happens in the United States House of Commons. And the main work of the objective of this office is to work in constant contact with experts from academic institutions. What it means is that this office tends to serve as an intermediary between parliament and the academic institutions so that they can always access information in the supply for the use of uh, parliament. Then we also have a data management department that has also been established recently and that is supposed to you know, mobilize data from all manner of sources, whether academic, think tanks, civil society, Ghana Sarkar Service, the UN, SDGs data and all that. So this department is supposed to mobilize these data and then update them periodically so that any time information regarding these data are needed, that can easily be provided. Remember, a parliament request for information comes at a short notice. And therefore, if you don't prepare and get yourself in readiness, you always find yourself in trouble when the request comes. Next. Now, in spite of these things that these uh, measures put in place by Parliament of Ghana, there are a number of factors that really inhibits Parliament's access to the use of academic research in Ghana. The first one is the lack of knowledge of the requirements of the needs of each other, both for the academic institutions and Parliament. There is this gap. They don't know, academic institutions do not know the form in which or the information that uh, Parliament needs. And then Parliament do not also understand the academic institution and what they have. The other one is that academic institutions and the uh, think tanks usually put their, their papers in a very technical form, and their language is also technical, such that members of parliament find it difficult to really understand these things and then use them properly. The other inhibiting factor we experience, particularly in Ghana's parliament, is that there, is, there isn't any avenue, you know, laid out procedure and guideline through which academic research can feed directly into legislation. And that becomes a challenge, even though there are efforts being made in that direction. The other one is that there is a mistrust and political clarification of some academic community members. Because in Ghana, uh, if, depending on where, where the information is coming from and how the, the, uh, the political angle or the parliament, members of parliament perceive that uh, academic institutions then I will either take it or not take it. Because some of them have been politicized. And as soon as their names are mentioned, uh, what comes to mind is that this person or this academic uh, institution that you're talking about uh, affiliates to a particular political angle. And therefore, uh, they, they pick the information coming from those institutions with a pinch of, of salt. The other one is the high cost of engaging parliament. That is always one of the things that comes from the academic institution. They feel that sometimes they want to engage parliament. They want to provide information. They want to invite them to seminars. They want to invite them to symposiums so that they can share knowledge and experiences. But they think that it's expensive because of the nature of members of parliament, because of the work they do, because of their time. It's expensive moving them around. And so this becomes an inhibiting factor, you know, uh, leading to comments assessing academic research. Next. So what is the way forward? How do we, you know, build a strong relationship between parliament and academic research in, uh, community so that we can always have the information that we need? We think that first of all, we should have a, mem a memorandum of understanding between these institutions both academia and parliament, so that there will be a clear guideline. There will be a clear procedure when and how information is needed from them and how it should be pro provided. Then there's also the need for us to train the academic researchers on the basic information requirements. Well, they should understand the kind of information that parliament needs. Academic institutions should know that parliament needs this kind of information in this form and in this language, so that I'm when... very sorry, 
we, we, we'll have to wrap up the talk there because we're, we're running yes. out of time. We need to hear well, from the next the, speaker. That's the last slide. We should also create platforms for knowledge sharing, either through symposiums and then what have you. Then the other thing is that we should establish uh, incentive packages for academic institutions, such as awards or something, so that we can get the two institutions together. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And love to hear more about the speaker lecture series as well. That sounds like a fascinating um, addition to everything that we've heard today. Uh, so the final talk in the session is from uh, uh, Pakistan, our colleagues in Pakistan. Um, so if we could uh, queue up the, the talk and again, just to reiterate, we're looking at seven minutes for the, for the presentations, if that's okay, Mr. Zekka. Thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, for uh, uh, Gurapal and uh, the organizing committee for giving the, giving the opportunity. I will be focusing, of course, on this bigger uh, talk that we are uh, dealing with, how parliamentary research services accesses and uh, uses Moving on to the next slide. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay. Right. So uh, parliamentary research is an applied in nature, act seeking to draw a wide range of existing knowledge and then to synthesize it in the form that is useful for honorable members of parliament committees who apply to understanding and solution of specific problems confronted by the legislature. So research involves, of course, uh, investigation of special national issues, providing situation analysis, identifying policy options, and proposing uh, concrete solutions based on uh, uh, gathered facts. So, of course, the parliamentary research, it, that's the uh, prime difference between academic research, which we focusing specifically on a single topic. But here, uh, the parliamentary researcher and even the academic researcher doing a parliamentary work needs to understand what is the purpose of the research. Now, like our research service is developing, and uh, uh, as per the standards, the as you grow in service, we only have six researchers, but all very talented one. And we provide informational researches, synthesis, analysis. Further on, if we go in depth towards scrutiny and in-depth investigation, of course, as the team grows, we will be offering that kind of uh, uh, mute, mute. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. Now the challenges, the first question was, what are the challenges of synthesizing academic research? What we have seen is that uh, academic researchers tend to use the complex theoretical frameworks. They use technical jargon, which is difficult for non-area readers. That is a member of parliament. They develop lengthy context setting, you know, review of literature, background before coming to the topic. So which is not necessarily required actually. For members, we have to be crisp in products which is ranges from a three-pager to a seven-pager, 2,000 words. Uh, the more it goes uh, in length, we have seen in Pakistan the possibility of members reading it completely and, uh, uh, you know, uh, gets a little uh, difficult. So uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, sometimes we have seen that as we started work, the academic researchers, they overlook inclusivity of diversity. Once I'm saying that, that a a country, we, Pakistan is a very heterogeneous, uh, you know, country with uh, 16, 58%, 60% youth bulge. Then we have local ethnic and religious communities. We talk, of, we need to have, uh, do gender mainstreaming. Then we have minority non-Muslim communities, poor uh, uh, laborers, daily wages, people from federating units and political thoughts. So like the academic researcher uh, to start with may not be, uh, you know, uh, seen through all these lens. So that is where what we do is that it's a partnership, a mix between the academic researcher and the parliamentary researcher working together in a team can overcome this challenge. Then as we, I think a lot of people have talked about it, that short deadlines, we've, uh, when we get five days for a research, we are celebrating. So uh, otherwise it's three, three days, sometimes one day, 
and it has and sometimes a few hours also so we cannot say no and be, because that is what ultimately builds the trust between the parliamentary researcher uh, uh, service and the and the members of the parliament so uh, uh, no question is a small question for us so we, we that that builds the trust and then we anticipatedly once to we provide a lot of products to the members this builds the relationships then expectations of having the latest credible data is also sometimes data is an issue also uh, but we have like economic survey parks and bureau of statistics certain organizations but we need to big contacts and librarians play a fantastic role in connecting to the universities we know we have a data of a uh, the research th thesis that are undertaking place in the universities. So we know exactly that good universities were good in research, undertaking good research and higher in those rankings. Those professors we engage, which are doing topics, you know, research topics on very relevant things, uh, uh, analyzing data and evidence, which is relevant to parliamentary uh, topics. Uh, at the moment, we have got, as I told you, only six researchers. But to start with, I think if any research service has to start, it needs to have experts in law, economics and finance, strategic studies, sustainable development and public policy. That is a good mix to start with, with a small team. We are fortunate that we are though only six, but four of us have been teaching in universities with over mutually 40 years of mutual experience of not only teaching in university, but we've undertaken uh, supervised 11 dissertations in different universities. So that also helps and connects us to the universities having taken that kind of work. Next, please. Uh, so next. See the best practices of synthesizing, uh, as I told you that the in-house researcher on every topic he interacts or she interacts with the member of parliament, understands the topic, then it is, has to be conveyed to an academic expert, which we, we outsource not all our researchers, but we have uh, the provi been provided resources that we can uh, outsource certain researchers. And we have a good pool of academic researchers that we uh, contact with. They give them a deadline. And then there's a close and intensive liaison between the in-house reviewer and the, and the academic uh, expert so that those three questions, four questions that need to be delivered should be answered. Uh, one way of best practicing is summarizing a theory and definition. If at all, it's good, we like that some theory uh, or theoretical framework is given in the research. So on the very pa first page of that research that is developed, uh, key terms that are not technical terms, in economy, for example, what is GDP, what is inflation, that may be uh, not known to every member of the parliament. Uh, so that, uh, and in and, and any theory, for example, just giving an example, functionalism, regional integration. So we'll define the non-technical jargon and the theory definition that would be applied in the research on right in the beginning on the first part, on the first page of the research, in fact. Then we use tables, matrices, matrices, infographics, and key statistics to, in the, in the uh, uh, research. That also helps make better presentation and provide evidence to the uh, members of the parliament. And as I have previously in the breaking group told also that ideally academics over the years, once they work with the parliamentary researchers, they become a kind of a continuous panel, like adjunct researchers, what I term them as. And then they, we have not only paid them at times, but they worked for honor also, a pre, a, a, without any, 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 any uh, thing. They feel honored once they uh, provide these expertise to the committees. So it's building a relationship with academia and expert, then academic researcher becomes integral part of the parliamentary research team. So then of course, once we are reviewing it, we need to, need to make sure that every research is fact-based, uh, means credible sources, which are trustworthy and uh, uh, sources have got the expertise of the areas, always check the footnotes, information until the very last moment any information can, can come in and we can just put it in. So th theoretical framework applied is relevant that we need to see balance and synthesis. This is very, very important. We need not, we need to be very precise in parliamentary research writing and no plagiarism involved. It goes without saying we have got softwares to check these things, but this uh, original writing, the more we uh, deal and engage academic research, of course, we uh, overcome this kind of problem. Then editing and proofreading, and last but not the least, your branding is very, very important also. Same font size, same style. So because the member would 
will would see your research if it's lying on a table and they say, okay, it's the institute's reading. It's a couple of pages that I must read and get into it. Next, quickly. Uh, can we move on to the next, please? Yeah. So building relationship with academic research, as I told you that initially we had a, we developed a national pool of 50 academic researchers, which now has included to over 100 experts, which includes 19 economists, lawyers. Now, what we kept doing with them that annually or after two years, we invite them and discuss these pros and cons and principles of parliamentary research so that they know what from, from academic research and parliamentary research, the changes that they need to make. So uh, this uh, uh, these experts, uh, of course, are of tremendous value the more they work with us. We've got uh, the, other, the other example also that we invited uh, international scholars from Bill Robinson, the former director of Congressional Research Service, a clerk from UK Parliament, uh, Mr. Rom Clement also. So we made them uh, work and talk to these academic researchers also. So that helps also in drawing the expertise. Then an important product uh, uh, publication that we started with was policy resource guide for committees. For example, if education, a small booklet in which we have the contacts, email details of all experts, civil society, practitioners, academics who are working for education, similarly health and so on and so forth. While making these policy resource guides on topical issues for committees, you tend to find a lot of researchers, a lot of academicians, a lot of civil society experts that you can connect with them. And you can invite them in expert hearings, public hearings with the committees. That is where you gradually evolve these relationships with the academia. We've also signed uh, MOUs, uh, formal MOUs with the leading universities like Kardasam University, Fatma Jana University, the top economic, uh, economy, uh, economic uh, development school, PAID, BIFA University. Then we have also core collaboration with the Foreign Office, uh, Think Tank, Institute of Strategic Studies, Institute of uh, Regional Studies, and we're going international also. I think I think the sound is cut out there. So, I'm sorry about that, but we're probably running over time anyway. But uh, Mohammed Zakhar has, has produced some really detailed slides that we'd be prepared to, to share with all our colleagues um, because Can there's some know? fascinating information on there around the, the parliamentary uh, research service in, in Pakistan as well. So thank you so much to all our all our speakers. Um, I hope you got a good flavour of the, the, the diversity of research uh, services that, that are there across the across the world um, and different things that are happening. I'm going to hand over to, to Vicky now um, and uh, she will let us know what the next step is in the in the session but thanks again to all our speakers it was really useful to hear these little snapshots of what's what's going on and hopefully that's the start of a conversation um, and not the end of it thanks mark yeah i guess um a session like this can only ever really be the start of a conversation um because there is so much information that people in the space have to share with us um so what we're going to do now is we're going to give you an opportunity to speak with each other again um in a more informal way um and what we've done is when you, everyone registered for the session, um, we asked you about key challenges that you're facing. And what we've done is we've developed those into nine different um, themes, which we are going to base the breakout rooms around for the next section. Um, so the and you can find these themes. Um, on the Jamboard, which is just hopefully, there it is. Thanks, Carlotta. Um, so if people would like to um, hop on over to this Jamboard, I can see loads of people arriving already. What you'll see here are there's, um, there's nine different uh, boards and you can flip through them by um, using the arrows on the top of the screen. Um, and what we'd like you to do is basically 
choose a breakout room um, to or choose a theme um, that you will then be able to go into a breakout room and have a discussion around that theme. And what we'd really like you to do is to um, discuss what the key challenges are that you're facing, but really importantly, um, to share with one another some possible solutions and opportunities and ideas, perhaps from your own research service, perhaps things that you've come across before. And, and also, also to summarize what the next steps are that um, you perhaps are going to take in your service, or perhaps you think that um, need to be taken in the space, that kind of thing. So. We've left those just there for you um, to use. And in each breakout room, we'd like you to um, be populating the relevant uh, slide there if you can. And also we're hoping that it will be an opportunity for people to look and see what other people are saying. So it's a resource that will be there that will enable you to um, then be looking and seeing um, ideas from other people. We'll come back to the main room. I hope that despite all of the technical challenges, there was time, a little bit of time to discuss some of that. We very clearly needed to organize a whole day event <laughs> to give everybody time to meet one another and connect. <laughs> I think most of us are here now. Mark, Vicky, would you like to reflect quickly on the dem boards? If you prefer, I can share my screen. Just seeing if Mark's here. Maybe they have such an interesting discussion that they can Maybe can't. so. Maybe so. Okay. Yeah, so there's a question uh, just come in the chat about sharing the jam boards. The jam boards are going to stay there for people to be adding to and looking at. And um, so the links to that we will we will send to participants after the event as well. Um, so do we have. Just wondering, do we have everyone back, Julia? I think so. OK, great. Well, clearly what we've demonstrated over the last three hours is three hours is not long enough to bring together a whole network of new people um, to talk about your own uh, work areas. Um, but what we have seen is that there's enormous appetite for that, which is absolutely fantastic and really exciting. Um, certainly it is for us. Um, I just hope that you all agree. Um, we, uh, it's, um, yeah, sorry, I was just distracted by a message. Um, so, um, please do keep adding to the jam boards. Please do also reach out to us if you would like to be connected with each other. So if you haven't had time to connect with somebody that you were particularly interested in connecting with or a country that you really want to find out more about in terms of their research service, please do reach out to us and we will arrange to put you in touch. Um, I think that's probably going to be our best way of doing it rather than just publishing a list of everyone's contact details. Um, so do please reach out for us that to us. That will be um, really good. The other thing um, that I've been reflecting on as the discussions have been happening is that actually it, it does feel here, and a few people have mentioned in the chat as well, this feels like it could be an emerging community of practice um, around parliamentary research services. Now, um, Mark and I certainly don't have the capacity, <laughs> or probably the skills actually, quite frankly, to be able to support that. Um, but 
uh, this might be something that you're interested in getting involved in or interested in hosting. Um, uh, so please do again reach out to us if that is something that you would be interested in doing, because the whole point with a community of practice is that the work is actually um, done by the people within the community um, with that kind of sense of mutual learning and so on. So we think that's um, probably going to be a good way forward for people from this. But um, we have got a feedback survey for you. Um, so we're going to share this and um, you, we're going to share this and it would be really, really good if we could get some feedback from you about not only how you found things, but also some ideas for next steps as well. Please do let us um, know about that. So do fill in the survey. It will help um, events to become better moving forwards. Um, and is that happening? Is that being shared in the chat or not? OK, excellent. Thanks, Julia. So that's going to be shared in the chat. Um, the other thing that's going to be shared in the chat is a link to the Agora Community of Practice website. So please do visit there if you haven't already found it. And please do reach out to us as well if you need other things included on the map or if you want to ask any questions specifically about the map. Um, I'm assuming that there's no more questions and everyone went nap by now will have run out of steam and just want to go and have a lie down in a dark room. Um, you know, well done, particularly to anyone here from the Southern Hemisphere who has, who has made it this far. Um, and it's been wonderful to meet so many people. Yulia, is there anything that I have missed? No, not really. Uh, maybe I can just add a little bit and thank you all very much for being here today and first of all I'd like to thank all of the renowned speakers for their excellent presentations thank you Jonathan, Lydia, Ida, Christoph, Christoph, Heather, Lalita, Stefan, Abraham, Mohammed, and of course many thanks to Mark and Vicky for all the efforts you've put in this event I would also like to thank my Interparse colleagues and especially Carlota who helped me throughout the whole event here today uh, and uh, the last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, partners of the Agora Community of Practice and all of you dear participants who are here today, despite night, day, morning time for you. I know it's challenging, uh, but we did, uh, we did our best to accommodate. Um, I would like to mention that uh, it's not the end, as Vicky has uh, just said, we will be there in touch with you, we'll follow up with more information coming from this event, we have recording of this that, we'll be, uh, that we will share later, we'll also share some more materials and slides, uh, useful links, uh, so all is left is uh, to kindly once again ask you to please share your feedback in the survey, which is very important for us. And we will uh, do our best to become better with events and planning and content and everything. And uh, um, let's keep in touch. Uh, and I wish you all a great day, evening, night, morning ahead. And I guess that's it.